Before I read, and um, today's reading is on page 900 of your Pew Bibles, it'll be Mark 12, beginning at verse 28. Let me just set the scene for this passage. It's the Wednesday before Passover. Christ is in Jerusalem and he's headed towards his death on the cross. And the Sadducees, they're resolute in their opposition to Jesus. They're not really interested in knowing who he is, but they are continuing to try and trap him with what they think are clever questions. They're really playing games. Trying to get Jesus to say something that shows he's just like anyone else. And they've failed to catch him out. And all they've succeeded in doing is they're revealing their own motives um, and revealing that Jesus has authority and that he does speak the truth. So that's where we are. Beginning at verse 28. One of the scribes approached. When he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, listen, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one and there is no one else except him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself, is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him any longer. Let me pray. Father, we are indeed blessed. We have your word in which you have revealed yourself. We have your son and his life, death and resurrection. And you have revealed yourself so, well, displayed yourself so completely there. We thank you, Lord. We pray that as we look at this, you might open our eyes and open our hearts further, that we might see you better and love you more. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we meet the teacher of the law, and he's not like the Sadducees. He's not trying to trap Jesus. He's got a genuine question. He just wants to know whether Jesus is a teacher of the truth. Does Jesus actually know what he's talking about? Does he actually have any authority in matters of the law? So the teacher asks this question. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, why does that question matter? It's a question that teachers and students of the law apparently debated at length. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? It's an important question because commands or laws eventually come into conflict with other commands or laws. In New South Wales, there's laws against speeding, Yet thankfully, it's a good thing that various emergency services are able to break that law, aren't they? That's a good thing. And Jesus makes the same point when he's confronted by the Pharisees about the disciples wandering through the field of wheat on the Sabbath and picking the heads and eating the grain. He reminds the Pharisees that the law permits temple priests to break the law concerning the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, they they serve in the temple. That's why this teacher's question is important. If you have to choose between two commands, obeying two commands, which one are you going to obey? Which one takes precedence over the other? Now, in his reply, Jesus quotes the first commandment listed in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the greatest commandment. For the purposes of this sermon, let me paraphrase it. 
Love the one true God with everything you have. The one true God with everything you have. There are echoes of this command right through Jesus' teaching. And if you look carefully, you'll see that Jesus also demands the same love for himself. When Jesus meets the rich young man, when he comes with his question, what must I do? Jesus tells him, go and sell everything you have. Follow me. But the young man loves his money, doesn't he? He can't do it. We see it in Jesus' statement that everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields because of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. Those who will inherit eternal life love Jesus more than they love family or possessions. So Jesus demands the same love for himself that God commands for himself. And the love being commanded here is not a small love. It's a love that is to come before all other loves. Love God above all things. Love Jesus before all things. Love God in spite of any other thing. That's what's commanded. Love Jesus above money. Love Jesus above family. Love Jesus above possessions. Love God in spite of your illness. Love Jesus in spite of the world abusing you. That's the love. No small love. And that's what's commanded by God and demanded by Jesus. Now that jars, doesn't it? How can you command love? That's not how we normally think of love. We usually think of love in a romantic context or a family context. Now next Saturday, many of us are going to come and witness uh, Ben and Sarah becoming the second still a family in our mob here. Now, just imagine if on Sunday morning Ben wandered in to Sarah and commanded her to love him. Now, you husbands out there will know how that will go. I suggested to Ben he don't try it. Um, I advise him it would not be a good idea. I've learnt something from my 40 years of experience as a husband. Um, but this commandment, this commandment is delivered in an entirely different context. There's a relationship between two unequals. There's a relationship between creator and created, between Lord and servants, between shepherd and wayward sheep, between judge and those who will be judged, between saviour and those who have been saved. That's an entirely different context. And it's that context in which God commands us to love him with everything we have. And one could say this is the foundational command of the true people of God. They are the people who love the one true God, with everything they have. Now that love isn't possible at all until we appreciate his love for us. Our response, our love is a response to his love. Andrew read 1 John 4 and in verse 19 it says, We love because he first loved us. And John argues that understanding God's love is the foundation on which our love for God and then our love for our brothers and sisters, that's the foundation on which our love is built. 
God's greatest display of his love is the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, isn't it? When we recognise, when we comprehend, when we understand what God has done, when we appreciate even a little bit of the magnitude of what Christ has done in bearing the judgement for our sins, our response is love. That's what John tells us. And that's something each one of us must understand for ourselves. There'll be people here today who have come for the fellowship or the community or before because their friends have come or because their spouse has come. Any number of other reasons. But the people of God come because they've understood that God the Father, Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit as one have provided a way that a holy God and condemned sinners can be reconciled to each other. That way is the, the way. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. It is God's love illuminated on the cross of Christ that brings us to love him. And each of us has to understand that for ourselves and respond in repentance and in love for our Heavenly Father. The vertical comes first and it comes down first. God has always loved us. But the Holy Spirit opens our eyes and we see. And he enables us, God enables us to love him in return. So in response to his love, we begin to love back. And then we're enabled to truly love in the horizontal plane to our brothers and sisters around us. Loving God comes before loving our brothers and sisters. John goes so far as to say, if we do not love our brothers and sisters, that's certain evidence we don't love God. And if we do love our brothers and sisters in a Christ-like way, that's certain evidence for our confidence on the Day of Judgment. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the one true God. The second is love your neighbour as yourself. Now, if conflict arises between obeying those two commandments, then the first is to take priority. The vertical before the horizontal. When the man hears Jesus' answer, he replies, Well said, teacher. He gets it. He knows which is the greatest commandment. And Jesus tells him he's not far from the kingdom of God. But does he love God? Or does he just know the law? We're at point four on the outline for those that are keeping track. Um, it's an obvious truth that we cannot love what we do not know. But knowledge of God can work in two ways. We may not know God because we have too little knowledge or we may not know him because we have too much knowledge. Let me explain. Da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci wrote, Great love springs from great knowledge of the beloved object. And if you little know it, you'll only be able to love it a little or not at all. If we don't know God very well, the love we have for him cannot be a great love because we may not be loving him as he truly is. 
How many of us are content to know just enough about God so we're reassured that we won't face his judgment? We're safe from his judgment. We know Jesus. I put it to you, if we don't know God very well, our sinful minds will just fill in the gaps. We'll make up the bits that we don't know. That's how our sin works. We make an idol. In our minds, we make a God who is not the God revealed in his word. We end up making up a God and loving that God. May not be the God of the word at all. We have God's revelation in his word, written and living. What do we do with it? I suggest a lot of us take it for granted. We don't study it, we don't pour of it, seek pour over it, seeking to know him better, to know him intimately. And once we do start reading God's word and get to know him more deeply, there may also be things we find out about him we don't like. Now, I used to think there were a whole bunch of people in the Bible that were hard done by, that were treated unfairly. Now, we tend to pass over those bits. We just set them aside or we choose to love the bits we do know and we sort the other bits out later. That will not do. God's word must shape us. We cannot sit in judgment of our creator and shape him into the God that you know the, that we make up, shape him to our individual preferences. Do we love God's justice? Do we love his sovereignty? Do we love all of him as he is? Then there's danger of too much knowledge. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. Now John helped us understand that we love God because the Holy Spirit has helped us to see God's love. There are some people who know a great deal about God's word, yet do not love God. A lifetime of study in the scriptures is no guarantee of a love for God. Now, in the first service, I went off script here, so I'll do it again. Um, there's an English preacher, Dick Lucas, and he talks in one of his sermons that I've heard online, he talks about a time he went to a church service and the minister up the front was delivering a sermon and he was converted in the middle of his own sermon. And Dick Lucas said you could see the second it happened. Suddenly he saw God's love. Suddenly he saw God's mercy. God's right to judge. There are theologians to know today who know far more than I'll ever know about God's word. And yet they don't love him. The Holy Spirit has not worked in them. And loving God leads to humility. It does not puff up. It leads to wonder and awe and praise and thankfulness. And knowledge without love leads to complacency and pride and death and destruction. The greatest commandment raises an obvious question for all of us. Seamus asked the kids, 
Do we love God with everything we have? The one true God with everything we have? It's an obvious question. And the answer, we all know the answer, don't we? That we don't do it. No. Only one man ever has. He is without sin. And because he is sinless, he's able to pay the price for our answer. Jesus demonstrated how much God loves us by his obedience, his obedience even to the point of death on a cross. Now I'm going to ask a much more discriminating question. Do we want, do we desire to love God with everything we have? What is your appetite for God, for the things of God and for fellowship with God's people? Is your time with the Lord each day an essential part of your day? Is the work God is doing through his people in the far-fung places of the world, is that often in your prayers? When Bible study is not on during school holidays, is it like something's wrong, something's missing? When you're away from here, do you have to go to church to be with God's people and sit under his word? Are the words of Psalm 63 your words? God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate and without water. Or maybe the words of Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? Our appetite for God and his concerns does not diminish when we begin to love him. When we begin to love him, we taste and we see that he is good and our appetite only increases. I once took Lynn away for a, a weekend a, a weekend away and we stayed at a flash hotel. Um, I have done it more than once in 40 years of marriage. Um, why, wiser than that. But um, anyway, we stayed at this flash hotel and we ate the hotel restaurant that night, um, mainly because we were tired. And that night we enjoyed a meal unlike any other I have ever eaten anywhere. The first taste was absolutely delicious. And as, and as the mouth, that mouthful sat in your mouth, the flavours developed and the textures contrasted and it was just marvellous. And, and then every mouthful just got better and better. And we were sitting there just... I mean, you don't often talk about how wonderful the food is, but we just sat there and talked about how wonderful the food was for, I don't know, how long, 20 minutes or something. Um, it was just exquisite. And I can't remember the tastes and the sensations now, but I, I remember the delight that we had 20 years later. Now, do you think after that first mouthful, our appetite was decreased. That would just be weird. We just wanted more and more of that meal. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And you'll want to feast on him. Never want to stop tasting. Now I've told you about that meal but you have no idea what it actually tasted like. No idea at all. Loving God's like that. You can be told how great it is by all sorts of people, from out the front, by your friends, by those around you. You can be told over and over, but until you taste for yourself, until you see how exquisite God's love is for yourself, you'll never know how good he is.
Paul prays for the Ephesians in chapter 3 of his letter to them. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. As we get to know God better and love him more fully, our appetite for him only increases and he will taste better and better. We are made for that. We will not want to know him better. Our love for him will only grow and grow. Paul's prayer is the Ephesians will comprehend the magnitude of God's love so that they are filled with all of his fullness. They will feast on him. Do you think the Ephesians could ever know the love of God fully in this life? No. But as they get closer to him, as they know him more fully, as they study the scriptures and meditate on the glories of God and of God's love for them, they will grow in their love of God and of their brothers and sisters. Now, God is a spring that becomes a flood as we grow closer. We're all familiar with the size-distance illusion, something we deal with all the time. It occurs because things take up more of our field of view the closer they are. God gets bigger as we get closer. <laughs> And we know him better and we love him more and we see more and more clearly how little we know of him. He is inexhaustible. His primary command, the greatest command, is we are to love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind and all our strength. I thirst for you, God. I long for you. They're the cries of his people. In a little essay called The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis wrote these words. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased. Are we content with the tawdry things of this world or do we yearn for the magnificent things of God? Are our eyes in the mud of the slum? Or are the eyes of our heart upward to our Lord and to his glory? Brothers and sisters, thirst for God. Seek him with everything you have, with all of your mind. Love him with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. Let me pray. Father in heaven, there will be people here today who are yet to taste and see how good you are. Please, Lord, send your Holy Spirit and open their eyes. Move their hearts so that they begin to love you. Father, for those of us that know and love you, please increase our appetites. Help us to desire greatly. Help us to feast on you, the inexhaustible one. Help us to lift our eyes from the mud of this world to your eternal glory and the glory that awaits those who are yours. Help us, Lord, to comprehend the length 
and width, height and depth of your love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of you, Lord, and show your love to this passing world. In Jesus' loving name we pray. Amen.